Good evening, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, aviation aficionados of all ages and types. I'm Jamie Beckett, AOPA Foundation Ambassador in Florida. Right over there is my buddy Pat Brown, the ambassador in Texas. We will argue throughout the night which state is better. Of course, Pat will win, but <laughs> I'll take a really good case. We are helped in the background tonight by the fabulous Eric Webb, who is taking care of all the technical duties. He has relocated to the basement of his palatial home in Virginia, but tonight he is bouncing the signal off the moon before it goes to the relay satellite just because he can. That's Eric Webb for you. Pat, welcome to the festivities. How you doing, man? This is episode 22. We are wailing on this thing. Ken, and they said it would never last. <laughs> Well, hey, I think we've got a really good topic tonight. I like it. Tidbits yeah. and oddities. Or maybe it's oddities and tidbits. I can't remember. And some trivia thrown in, too. And we've already got Sandra from, from Fort Lauderdale Executive. Hey, Sandra. Fort Lauderdale Executive is pretty darn nice. Have you ever been there, Pat? Uh, Lauderdale. Yes, I have, as a matter of fact. Nice it's airport. A very nice destination. Hello, Martin. Nice to see you. And yes, thank you for the reminder. I was going to bring this in, but now you've spoiled the surprise. <laughs> Pat Brown, right there. Average looking human, you would think. You know, if you met him in line at the supermarket, you'd say, that's just a regular guy. No, that is a Master Pilot Award recipient. Pat Brown, congratulations. That is a huge deal. 50 years as a pilot, and, and you're still only in your mid 40s. I don't know. How you uh, yeah, well, I started it when I was five. I was an overachiever. This is uh, <laughs> this is this is what that looks like. And uh, there's a there's a whole thing that goes along with it. I have to tell you, it's it's really kind of amazing. The FAA keeps every piece of paper that ever had your name on it. And in wow. this particular case, that's my entire pilot record dating back to 1969. So <laughs> it's been a long time, but it's been a great ride. Man, that, seriously, that's great. I'm, I'm not there yet, but only because I started late. We're of the same vintage, really, but I started yeah. a little late. You'll um, get there, Jamie. You'll get there. You just have to be 90. Uh, <laughs> not far <laughs> off. Hey, I got to say hey to Glenn DeSena. Hi, guys, right back at you, Glenn. And Dominic Carpenter, nice to see you, man. Thanks for popping in. Tonight, Pat, I think I would like you to expound on the word aviation. You know, we talk about it all the time. We work in it. We recreate in it. Where the heck did that term come from? Does Funny you should ask. Didn't know. That's right. Funny you should ask. It's like it's like could be like we rehearsed this. I don't know. Oh, that's crazy talk. <laughs> actually, I actually wrote it down because I don't want to. I don't want to mispronounce anything or 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 anything like that. Aviation was coined by a Frenchman, as so many terms in, in our activity are, we'll talk about maybe some of those later, it was coined by a Frenchman named Gabriel La Lanel in 1863, originally from the word avier, or avier, I guess, I'm not, I don't speak French, uh, which had its root in the Latin word avis, or avis, for bird, and then asian, I'm not sure where that came from, perhaps it's French, I don't know, but that means action or progress. So apparently aviation means bird action. 1863, that was Civil War era here, and, and aviation was just balloons at that point. There was no yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So so much for your useless trivia that you can win a beer uh, during a bar argument or something like that. But I just thought that was really kind of, I, I, I'm kind of a geek when it comes to roots of words and things like that, So because uh, I don't really have a life. I like it, though, and I, I got to admit, I never heard that. I didn't know it was from the 1860s, yeah. but it, it's a good framework for what we're talking about tonight, which pretty much is all weird little odd things <laughs> in that many of us have never thought of. By the way, Antonio is tuning in all the way from Brazil. Pat, you're international, and, and Glenn Ponis from Pensacola, way up wow. on the floor. He's, he's the dead middle between us right now. Well, so Pensacola now, now Glenn works for us at AOPA, and I thought he was up in Frederick, Maryland. So he's he's playing hooky, perhaps. He, he appears to be mobile. Yeah. Let's talk about, since we talked about the, the origin of aviation, which I just learned something. I like it. And, of course, it would be French, like aileron and empennage and all the other French. Well, I have the definitions of those, too, if you want. Oh, <laughs> Let's do it. This is like Dictionary Corner on 8 out of 10 counts. 
All right, all right. So fuselage is French, and the translation for that is spindle-shaped. Interesting. Aileron is French for little wing. Empennage is French for to feather an arrow, which actually makes some sense if you look at the shape of the empennage of most airplanes. It looks like the three arrows that are on the, or the three feathers on the back yeah, of the arrow, yeah. except for, for a V-tail bonanza. have not figured that one out yet, but it, at any rate. Uh, and, uh, of course, the word pedo is, the, is uh, from uh, the French Henri, Henri, pedo, who invented the thing. So they're oh, so old. he did himself. He himself invented it and named it after himself. That's exactly right. There's no ego involved there. <laughs> I like that a lot. Well, you know, there's some other things though that are that are named after people, and one of the and of course there's the, Bern, the Bernoulli principle. You know, the idea you know that, that lift is based on. But there's another interesting um, uh, part to the theory of lift that most people don't hear about. In fact, I didn't learn about it until years ago when I was doing my uh, multi-engine, and the guy asked me, the examiner asked me, what is the Kawanda effect? And I thought, it sounds like, you know, some like one of those black and white Chinese bears, but yeah. that's not what he was talking about. The Kawanda effect is the effect that actually makes the air stick to the wing as it goes over the top. And if oh, you wow. want to prove that, if you want to prove that it really does, does exist, either take a spoon or take a glass jar without the label on it, and put the curved part of the spoon underneath a stream of water or put the, 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 the glass jar underneath the stream of water and watch how the water adheres to the size of the jar or the spoon until it's at the bottom and then drops off. It doesn't just come down and fall. And it's the Kawanda effect that keeps the water adhered to that curved surface till it gets all the way down to the bottom. Same thing applies to, a, a, to air fluid dynamics. I have so, a story that relates to that. There you go. More I trivia that you did not know. I love it. I went to a flight instructor refresher course once where Mr. Kirshner was one of the presenters. If you remember, Mr. Kirshner was. He, wrote he was the king. He knew everything. He had a spin master. He used, do, he used to do spins in a 150. And he had been training some FAA folks and shooting some video. And he went and put tufts of yarn on the wing. And he, he put um, funnels conical funnels on fishing line that trailed back from the wing so you could see the airflow as the airplane stalled and spun. And he told this story because as he finished up, the, the head of the FAA program, all the people he had trained, said, you know, that was just amazing, that video. It was great. How did you decide to do the red funnels? Was that like because it would stand out against the clouds in the sky or you know whatever? And it was this big, long thought process. And, and Mr. Kirster said, that's what Walmart had. <laughs> I just love that. It's just great. Well, hey, let's talk about something really common in aviation now that wasn't a long time ago, checklists. Yeah. Have you ever thought of where did checklists come from? Because Orville and Wilbur didn't use them. Certainly the <laughs> original male pilots back in the 20s didn't use them. World War I pilots didn't use them. Um, even the air racers in the 30s weren't using checklists for the most part. Any idea where it came from, Pat? You know, Jamie, that's one of those things that has kept me up at night. And I, I figured you would be able to enlighten me. So I'm looking forward to a good night's sleep tonight. Well, I always found this fascinating. It actually comes from the B-17 military trials um, in the 30s. Um, the Army had, the Army Air Force had put out a call for a, a heavy bomber, and among those was the B-17, and it just did great in the trials. It was absolutely the leading contender. The Air Force is like, this is a done deal. We want to see one more flight. So the crew went out and jumped in the airplane, and they got everything fired up, and they took off, and right after they took off, realized nobody ever re removed the locks. All the Ooh. control lines are still on. The aircraft crashed. It was a tragic thing. But that was when people kind of woke up and realized aircraft have become complex enough that it really is important to have an itemized list of how do we safely perform this. And, of course, those of us, you know, I brought up, I had a Cub from the 40s once. Right. That came with a comic book. There really was no POH. It was literally a comic book. And... We were just talking earlier, I'm, I'm purchasing a 1966-172 G model, 
which has a very slender POH. Now, yes, the 172, it's considerably bigger. Over time, those checklists have gotten bigger and bigger. Those POHs have included more and more material that's actually pertinent. You really should read it. Could I get a witness on that? You really uh, should. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me have an amen. <laughs> but I always found that fascinating that something that we take for granted, well, we should use the checklist every flight, even if you've been flying for 50 years like Pat Brown, master pilot. Still I, do still, I do still use the checklist every day religiously, absolutely. I do as well. And, you know, even in the 152, you might be tired or maybe it's been a while since you're in there. Or maybe you're flying a similar type of aircraft to yours, but it's a different one. So it's got some glass in it or an autopilot or something you weren't thinking of. Checklists are golden. And it's interesting that that's where they originated with a crash because... It was just too many items for people who were working away to remember all of them. So, it, and it's interesting that that over the years, those you know that concept of a checklist has made it into other um, other professions, notably the medical profession. Um, and within the last. Infection yeah, rates are going down in hospitals that use checklists. Yeah. Exactly right. This was I don't remember exactly when it happened, but I, I can I can remember hearing it on the news that that uh, that, that the medical profession is taking a uh, taking their cue from aviation and and beginning to implement the the use of checklists in, in operating rooms and and I suppose other critical care areas. But uh, yeah, and it's made a difference. I look at by the way, Marty LeBlanc is on here. I wonder if he's related to Matt LeBlanc. That would be <laughs> he says AOBA teaches me more every day. Marty, thanks a lot. It's the interaction, it's the back and forth between y'all and us that really makes it fun for us. By yeah. the way, Pat, I did not mention if, if somebody has a question about something we talk about tonight or anything else, they can write to us at ambassadors with an S at AOPA.org and we'll actually answer you because we're very lonely. We just sit in our little study and we answer emails. But no, we have to take this stuff. And thank you, Marty. That's really complimentary. I appreciate it. And okay, talk so, to, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say before we get off a checklist here, Ed, uh, Ed uh, CEW, I don't want to take a chance on how to pr pronounce that. Uh, says there are studies that show overly inclusive checklists are counterproductive and there are numerous styles of checklists and you're you're absolutely right absolutely right i don't have much more to add to that except that you know make sure that when if especially if you make your own checklist which you can certainly do based on your poh um, mm -hmm. you just make sure that it, it's pertinent to your airplane and it has the things that that are are critical to the safe operation of your airplane you know, that's a really good point. A lot of people, and I've had people ask me this, you know, can I make my own checklist? Well, it, it really shouldn't be a random thing. But, for instance, the airplane I'm purchasing, it was built in 1966. And it had a six-pack, and it was very basic and 40 degrees of flaps and all that. Well, it's been upgraded to 180-horse engine now. It's got Avidine glass in it. It's got Garmin glass in it. It's got autopilot. There's an avionics master that didn't used to be there. If I start with that original checklist from the POH and then start inserting things that are pertinent because it's part of the upgrades, that makes sense. Because now, for instance, it doesn't have 40 degrees of flex, it has 30. You know, it's just nice to be able to put in the appropriate things. And, you know, there, there's nothing wrong with making a, a checklist that pertinent to your aircraft. As you say, Pat, as long as it starts with the one that was in the POH, because you don't want to pull things out like that silly mag check. <laughs> that might matter at some point. Yeah, that pesky mag check just takes some time. And, you know, uh, and if it's running rough, it, I don't really want to know that. And by the way, I'm kidding. <laughs> I just, I just want to make it really clear. I am kidding. <laughs> well, that's actually Gloria Bailey's point and the need for risk assessments before each flight. You know, we use that checklist, but there's also the pave checklist and yeah. three fees and all that. And how am I feeling? What kind of shape is the airplane in? What's the weather look like? Did I see all those things come into play? So checklist is not just that one piece of paper. There's a whole lot to it. I like that. I yeah. feel good. Now, don't you feel good? I feel like I can sleep tonight knowing all about checklists now. Thank you for uh, that. Um, I, I'm going to butcher this. Is that walk-in 
Hochschild, and I apologize, I, I've never seen that name, so I, I'm feel free to call me an ugly name for mispronouncing yours. A friend parked their Cessna 152 and forgot the parking brake. The plane rolled back and almost hit the pump. Man, that could be an expensive error if, if you uh, hit the elevator or the uh, the, ele the elevator or the rudder. Those are yeah. expensive parts. So I'm looking at I'm looking at the little the little icon there, and this is how bad my eyes are from this distance. I thought that was a beer. <laughs> I like it. Pat, <laughs> let's talk about transponders, shall we? I, I, I that have would be great. Big desire to talk about transponders, and the the peculiar question. I'm throwing this out to the audience, by the way. If you have a, a thought on this, put it in the comments. Why? Does a transponder go from zero to seven on the four digits? There's, there's all. It doesn't go from zero to nine like our number system. It goes from zero to seven. What do you think? Is anybody going to pick that up? Uh, I think, think you know something. I think that now we need the Je the Jeopardy uh, thing. While people are thinking about that, though, let's reply real quick to Ed Ed's comments. It thought that the POH was required starting in 1975 as part of the type certificate. Did any planes before 1975 have have a POH? as opposed to a, high, a pilot handbook. Oh, and I'm going to let him answer that. I would do it, but I'm going to let you do it because I'm gracious. No, I would actually prefer you do it because you're the A&P. You would know that. Oh, okay. Um, this is an interesting thing. A pilot's operating handbook is a generic book. The airplane flight manual is specific to your aircraft. So you can go on to Amazon or Sporties or whatever and buy a POH for your airplane. It's generic. It doesn't actually pertain to your airplane. It's that type of airplane. When we talk about POH, what we usually mean is the aircraft flight manual, which is the book for that particular airplane with the specific equipment list, the weight and balance and all that. And it's true. Way back, as I said with the Cub, it came with a comic book. There was literally nothing to it. Yeah. It's been I was thinking... I don't know. Go ahead. No, and I, and I was thinking that it was later than 1975, but that it, it, it was definitely in that time frame. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this from memory. I, I was thinking later than 1979 75, where, where the requirement was, was tail number specific. And, uh, but it could very well be 1975, but he, but he's right. Ed's right about that. Yep. And he's back with, Octal code goes zero to seven. Octal is a number system. Like we have the decimal system. There's the binary system. There's octal. There's hexadecimal. There's all kinds of stuff. Um, kind of, Ed, that's true. Um, we have four digits. The original transponders had two. Now we have four. But in a binary system, you need a four-bit word to fit into that. And zero to seven is four bits four digits. So zero is zero, 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 zero. Seven is one, 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 which means you've got a four and a two and a one. And so it's, that's kind of it. If, oddly enough, it, it just goes to the basics of binary because binary works well with electronics. Off is a zero, on is a one. So there's, it goes from zero to seven because in four digits, that takes up all the possible combinations between four zeros and four ones. And, and how many possible combinations is that, Jamie? Oh, it's got to be six or eight at least. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the 4096 code transponder, right? 4096 options. And, you know, here's a weird thing. And I, I heard this years ago, and it was it's probably changed now with ADSB. But there was a time not that long ago, if you were flying into AirVenture or Sun and Fun, they would actually have you turn transponders off because it would overload the system. It just couldn't handle that many returns. Right. And I think that's kind of funny because every technology has a breaking point. <laughs> exactly right. Thank God that we don't have that anymore. So. And, and Ed comes back. I love this. Ed, you are a cool dude. He says, oops, octal is three bits, hexadecimal is four bits. Binary, and it's just—it's the way it works. It's just an electronic geek thing, but that's why it's not zero to nine, like seven, and that's our limitation. But yeah, it works. Yeah, I love this. I love this trivia stuff. It's just—it's so much fun because you can never know it all. So I'm—I'm I'm learning stuff here too. 
Do we have a picture of a transponder, by the way, to, to show folks just in case they're they're nostalgic? And oh, look at that! I like that. I think I've flown that very one. <laughs> I know I have. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that's that's back in the analog days where you had to turn the knob to get. Yeah. And you know I learned Pat to start on the right and work my way left, mm -hmm. so I didn't actually put in seven six zero zero or seven seven zero zero. Always work left to right. And, or, and it's, or, or worse, seven, 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 seven. Yeah, that would be very bad. Eric Pittman has come in. Hey, Eric. Eric uh, is a proud Publix employee in Columbia, South Carolina. He's actively shopping for a Cherokee 140. I have a feeling he's going to find it. He is tenacious. That guy is just going to get there. Hey, they're, um, they're out there. You just got to look. Do, do we have a picture of a digital transponder? Um, oh, look at that. So Not modern. Really. So cool. Exactly the same thing, though. I mean, that's the same limitation. You, those four digits, one, two, zero, zero, they're going to be zero to seven. You'll never see an eight or a nine on there. That's exactly right. Plus, look at all the extra functions this one has on it that the other one didn't. You know, I got it. I love these because you can just push that VFR button and you're back to one, two, zero, zero from your, <laughs> your squat code. That simplifies life. Yeah, it sure does. Of course, now some of the modern avionics, all you got to do is key a particular little button on your thing and say squawk one, two, zero, zero, and the voice command takes care of it for you. I was flying with somebody yesterday who has that, and he has voice commands that you can use. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm just flying the airplane, man. <laughs> That's a level beyond what I'm willing to do. <laughs> Way. I, I just wonder if it, if if it, if something goes wrong and you should utter a curse word, does it recognize that? <laughs> Let's go find out, shall we? <laughs> Pat, are you bring up a thing during Rusty Pilots. We do Rusty Pilots as a tag team, just like this, the Rusty yeah. Pilot webinars for AOPA. In more normal times, we both do them independently in live settings and have a lot of fun with them. But one of the things you bring up that I find absolutely fascinating, and in all honesty, I did not know, is echo airspace can be a whole lot more complex than we think, although as pilots, we don't have to worry about it. That's right. What's the deal with echo? Isn't it just echo, echo? Well, if anybody set in on any of our Rusties, you'll know the answer to this. But there are actually eight types of class echo airspace, eight. But as Jamie says, you just treat them all the same. And for for example, class echo to the ground, that's the dash magenta line. We might have a picture of that up uh, here. Yeah, there you go. That's okay. class echo to the ground, class echo to the ground. And that's considered to be a class echo too. Um, if you're uh, if you're talking about the uh, that uh, the ring around the uh, outside of the of the dash line, do we have another echo out there? Another echo sound there. That one right there, that one is actually class echo five. And it just all has to do with where echo starts in relative to the ground or whether it's a class echo extension to a class delta or some other type of or class Charlie airspace or or what have you. So, um, it, yeah, it, it's just one of those useless pieces of trivia information. Again, that might win you a beer in a, in a bar one night. Um, so that's just fun to think about. It means absolutely nothing. You don't treat them any different than anything else. By the way, Stephen Getch, uh, who, uh, who's going to be one of my check ride victims here coming up, or, or excuse me, applicants coming up here uh, in the next week or two, says, why is there an eight and a nine on the right of that, of that transponder there? And it's because there are other things that you can do when you go into the function uh, button there. Um, and uh, you can also uh, use your, your uh, uh, there's a clock up and a clock down and some other things that you can do that you'll need an eight and a nine for. That's the reason. You notice though that there is a gap between the seven and the eight. With the, they, they make it fairly plain that that's not for the, the transponder function, but you're right. It's, we still use a base 10 system and everything else we do. Oh, so, Mark, uh, Grady, Mark Grady sent us a note. Mark, I love you. <laughs> You see Mark's comment there? He says, two of the best, most talented pilots I know of, Pat and Jamie. Mark, the check is in the mail. Thank you. Mark is the coolest guy in the world. And, and maybe one of the few people on the planet with more 152 time than I have. And he is just hysterical about it. <laughs> he is. I think Mark, I think Mark has something like 6,000 hours in a Cessna 150 doing traffic reporting over on the East Coast. So uh, you have my admiration and my sympathy, my friend. 
Hey, back to the class echo thing, and I, I just want to bring this up because it's not all esoteric stuff that's of no interest. If you go look, uh, you can go to skyvector.com, the, the web page, and it'll show you all the airspace in the United States. Go to the VFR chart for Jacksonville and look at the Orlando class Bravo. And if you look at um, Orlando Executive Airport, it only goes up to, the delta only goes up to below 1,600. There's a space in there. If you try and envision this in 3D, and Pat, we've talked about this before, there is a space of echo airspace inside the Bravo that can't be gotten to without going through the Bravo. It's just a little suspense. It's like a cherry in a jello mold. <laughs> and that's what first started getting me fascinated by this. Because from the pilot's perspective, echo is echo. Yeah. There's no equipment requirement. I don't have to talk to anybody, but I have ATC services if I want them. Yeah. But I can see how from a regulatory side, I've got to be able to differentiate between all the different types of echo because they're everywhere and they're very diverse. Yeah, you know, knowing that something is echo one or echo three or echo five, it that you know, that is absolutely useless information. But knowing when when you're looking, let's say at at a dashed magenta line that's an extension off of a class Delta Airport, for example, it's important to be able to realize, oh, it's not important that you know, oh, that's class Echo three, but it's important to know that that particular Echo goes all the way to the surface. That's the really important stuff, and that your cloud clearance and visibility requirements are what they are, and so on and so forth. So, um, it you know, I I got to me uh, what what really set me on the on the uh, on the quest to figure this out was we we had been doing rusty pilot for God, how long we've we been doing that jamie i mean we aop has been doing a rusty pilot seven seminar years. for six seven years now right okay. and 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 you know i've done as many as probably 18 to 20 a year when we were doing them live and we're doing two a month you and i are doing two a month you know virtually like this and we get to uh we get to uh i think it's an fdc notum slide where it talks about a change in the Eufaula class Echo 5 airspace. And for the longest time, I just never really paid much attention to that. And then one day I thought, Echo, E5, what the heck is that? So it sent me on this quest and it took a little bit of digging, but but I sure found it there on, on Google, which is, as you know, is a repository of the entire world's knowledge. And it was right there. And I found this, this piece of paper that, and I thought, well, that's just an interesting piece of trivia. It means nothing, but it's kind of fun to know. So anyway, that's that's how that all came about. You know, and that's why I hang out with you, Pat, because you're super smart and you do most of my homework for me. It's perfect. <laughs> Speaking of that, we had talked about the word aviation coming from 1863. I love that. Let's go almost that far back in the modern fleet and start talking about B-52s. Almost oh, everybody my. knows what it is. The B-52, it's been around a little while, hasn't it? And since the early 1950s, 1955, I think I was I was but a mere baby, but uh, I, I I think it was 55 was when it made its first flight, and I was doing a little bit of reading the other day, and stumbled onto the fact that uh, the the, uh, uh, the the services ten, are, are intending to continue flying the B52 with the, obviously with upgraded avionics and engines. Uh, into the 2050s, and I mean, just think about that for a minute. Yeah, uh, years old. yeah think about if the right flyer was still flying in uh, in 2003. I mean, that I mean, I mean, that starts to put things in perspective. From 1903 to 2003, you're still using the right flyer. Well, I mean, that's kind of that's kind of a weird, incredible thing. <laughs> Eric, do we have a picture of a B-52 just in case somebody's not familiar? It is a monster machine. It is just huge. It's got eight turbine engines. It can carry one heck of a bomb load. Because the wings are so wide, the, the landing gear turns because you can't land in a crowd. So the airplane will actually land crooked in a crosswind. Right. It's a truly amazing machine. But as you say, Pat, it was designed and built in the early 50s. It's still in use, and of course, the avionics have been upgraded and all that. Same problem that the 737 had, that because of the, the wing design, you can't put a high-bypass turbofan on it. So it's yeah. still got eight 
engines on it, yeah. but man, yeah. it's an amazing. Yeah, it, it, it's an amazing thought, and and you know I'm I'm reading now where the grandchildren of some of the original pilots are now flying that airplane, and just I mean just. I mean, just if you really, I mean, it's just, it's kind of, I don't even know how, to, I'm, I'm struggling for words because I don't have the words. Because again, you start thinking about how, how far we came from, from the Wright brothers' first flight just to World War II. And then I from did. World War II to, to landing on the moon. And yeah, amazing. I used to help out over at Fantasy of Flight, Kermit Week's personal collection, and they would have open cockpit days. And I used to really like, the P-40 Warhawk. I still like the P-40 Warhawk. It's neat. But I'd help people get in the airplane, and I'd tell them the story about it. And the thing that always fascinated me, that was the airplane the Flying Tigers flew. That that was the beginning of World War II in the Asian theater for America. That was what we were using. That plane was built by the same company that 20 years before was building the Jenny. Wood and cotton and an engine so anemic that it couldn't hold altitude in a turn. You had to descend in a turn in the original 90 horsepower, which weighed 400 and something pounds, just the engine, 90 horsepower. Right. I mean, it's remarkable that in 20 years, they went from one of those to the other. And now we're looking at 100 years for the B-52. But I can do better than that, Pat. I, well, I, I can't wait. I can't wait. Tell me, tell me what you have, Jamie. The U-2 spy plane, you know, the famous Francis Gary Powers got shot down. It's basically a motor glider. It'll go up to 70,000 feet. It's an amazing thing. Built around the same time. And, oh, look at that. Just just the coolest airplane. Slow as molasses, but it can get up very high and fly for a long time. Last year, Scientific American published an article about the U-2, quoting Air Force officials. It flew, I believe, the first time in 1953, 55, somewhere in there. But they believe that it is now 20% of its life. It has 80% left to go, and it's 65 years old. That's amazing. It is <laughs> it amazing. Five longer. It's amazing. And that's because it's a non-pressurized aircraft. The pilot wears a spacesuit and an astronaut's outfit. But because it's not pressurized and it's not any exotic metals and it's not any kind of weird high speed, whatever, this thing's just going to keep going and going and going. So we can literally tell ourselves that it is entirely likely that our grandchildren, even Eric Pittman's grandchildren, <laughs> might still be looking up and seeing B-52s and U-2s 50 years from now. Yeah, the U2, they're all easy miles. They're all highway miles. There's no, there's no city driving in the, in the U2. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. Easy if, they have, if you ever get a chance to search YouTube and you see U2 landings, it's the wildest thing in the world because it's center line gear. It, it's mono gear. So there's a truck with a U2 pilot chasing the U2 down the runway, calling out the altitude for them to land. Yeah. It's the wildest thing in the world, yeah. but the U-2 and, and the B-52, they're paid for. And aircraft today, to be competitive in a military structure, are incredibly complex and expensive. Yeah, It's just more cost-effective to keep refitting them and using them. It's pretty yeah. amazing. Uh, let's see. Rick Chambers just got here. Rusty Pilot says, hello, or link to find local FBO. Um, I don't. I don't uh, know. We have we have a link at, at AOPA to find flight schools, but we don't I don't think have a link to find local FBOs uh, that the best thing to do there. I think would just be to Google local FBO. But we do have a, uh, I'm not sure if Eric can pull up the link for our flight school finder. But uh, but we've got we've got one of those or. Um, uh, Rick, you can uh, send an email to ambassadors at AOPA.org, ambassadors, plural, at AOPA.org, and we'll find that answer. We'll find an answer for you if you're not real sure. And if you're a Rusty Pilot, you can go to Rusty Pilots, plural, RustyPilots.org, and uh, tell you all about how to sign up for one of our Rusty Pilots courses. And I was wrong. I knew we had a directory. I just didn't know if we had a link to it uh, easy, easily enough to uh, to access. So Eric there you White, go. A remarkable human being. He is Johnny on the spot with everything. I, I'm pretty sure if we said, 
Hey, Eric, throw up that pancake recipe from last Saturday. I'm pretty sure he could do it. I'll bet he could do it. I, we're, I, I think we should put him to the test, Eric. Can you find that pancake recipe real quick? And yes, Rick, the AOPA Rusty Pilot Program is, is rustypilots.org. That's the website, rustypilots.org. And that will tell you um, uh, when our next uh, uh, webinar is. Okay. And you're welcome. <clears throat> and uh, Rich Dunker's got a good point. Looking for an FBO, start at the local airport. Just That's Those really airports are usually municipally owned or county owned. <laughs> Some are privately owned by public use. But the FBL is a, is a business that's open to the public. Go in, grab a Coke, ask some questions. But since the topic of Rusty Pilot came up, Pat, I'm going to have to do this. Uh, we just had a comment from somebody. Uh, Rick Chambers was saying, AOPA Rusty Pilot Program? Question mark. If you have not been current for a while, and... This was me at one time. I was home with the kids when they were little while my wife traveled for work. Uh, Pat, I think you were rusty for a couple of weeks at one point. Yeah, about yeah, 12 years. It used to be very hard to get back in. But now yeah. with the Rusty Pilot Program, which is either in person where somebody like Pat or Kay or Kay Sundrum or myself will come teach that, or we do the webinar version now during COVID, it's two hours to three hours of fairly intensive ground school that really gives you the coverage. Some people go multiple times, but as it happens, Pat, I have some comments from people who have been through a recent Rusty Pilot webinar. I'm not saying it was one Pat was personally involved in, it's possible, but they say things like, this program was outstanding. It gave me much more confidence about getting back in the air and sooner rather than later. The presenters were excellent and mixed in humor to keep the mood light yet engaging. I can't imagine using humor in a education. It could, yeah, it could. It couldn't have been you. That could not have been you. Uh, great program. Thank you for putting it together and making it so available, engaging, crusty, rusty pilots like me. <laughs> and, and here's a great one: somebody who's attended multiple, learning something new each time attending an AOPA Rusty Pilots webinar. That's the thing, you know, every time you go, you pick up something new. Pat has taught me things like that Echo 5. I, I would like to think I've taught Pat things. Everybody yeah. knows something somebody else doesn't know. So it's it's absolutely great. If you're an AOPA member, it's free. Go to as many as you want, live or webinar, many as you want. If you're not a member, it's $89, which happens to be the same cost as an annual membership to AOPA. So in all honesty, Pardon the commercial. You might consider just becoming an AOPA member. I believe it's the largest membership organization in aviation, isn't it, Pat? That is true. And I would point out too that that you and I and Kay, uh, we are all we all are paid members of AOPA. Yep. Um, and and um, I, I know that uh, I know that we also uh, make uh, some donations to the PAC and some other uh, opportunities to keep our you know, keep, frankly, keep our rights to, to fly um, available to us because you, you know that the government creep is always there trying to figure out ways to, to uh, curtail what we do. So uh, anyway, but this should not be a commercial. So let's move on to some more trivia. What do you think? Oh, okay. I, I was about to bring up the coffee canister. And talk about <laughs> Here's one we didn't talk about before. Pancake <laughs> recipe, thank you. Eric has proven himself. He has the pancake <laughs> recipe. It's amazing. <laughs> I'm telling you, you tune in to Ask an Ambassador. You can find the answer to any question you want. Hey, I'm going to throw one more at him. How about cooking a turkey for Thanksgiving? Uh, uh, a turducken. Let's a make a turducken. <laughs> turducken. Good luck to you. You challenge, Eric. Challenge. <laughs> we didn't talk about this one before, but I'm going to throw this in, Pat, because I, I think you're going to react well to this, and I, I believe you're intellectually nimble enough to take it. If people were to look just over your shoulder there, they might see something that looks remarkably like a guitar. There is I one there, yes. I've been fascinated for my entire career at the percentage of pilots who are also musicians. As you know, I have about 30 guitars in my house, two pianos, three, four yeah. drum sets, and yeah. it's disease. I, I can't help it. I'm with but, you, buddy. I've got about seven guitars sitting in my cedar closet in addition to the two that are behind me. Have you found the same thing? Staggering percentage of pilots are also musicians? 
Yes, and in fact, I'll do a shout out to the Fine Musicians Association too. Uh, great, there you go. great, great, great people there. Um, uh, yeah, and and you know, it's funny because it, I mean, you and I both have a background in the music industry, and mm -hmm. before we, you know, the the, the before the this hair's still on hold. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm right there with you, buddy. <laughs> But, uh, you know, in fact, I look, I mean, I'm only 27 years old, but I look this way because I've been a professional flight instructor in my entire life. Uh, yep. At any rate, um, no. And I was in I was in the music industry. Uh, the company that I worked for made uh, drumsticks, mallets and percussion accessories. Uh, uh, the company shall remain nameless because this is not a paid political announcement. But uh, uh, so I worked very, very closely with drummers and some of them whose names uh, and bands anybody that's listening would would recognize but my point there is that i don't care how big name famous drummers or what have you were out there uh, if there was an up and coming young player young student um, adolescent whatever um, uh, there was a camaraderie there a willingness to share a willingness to support and i've been a pilot since i was 16 years old and i have found that in that particular industry and, and activity it's the same thing if you find someone that that is interested in aviation you want to take them by the hand and grab i was i, I went and flew to a, a restaurant real close to, to to our home airport today for a quick uh, hamburger with some friends the hundred dollar hamburger and there was this young uh, man his name is hunter and he's nine years old, and he was standing outside watching the airplanes land. The restaurant is right on the airport. And his grandmother was with him, taking pictures of him watching these airplanes. So I walked up to her and said, would you mind if I took him out to see a, a real airplane up close? And she said, no. So I went up and I, I, I said, what's your name? He said, my name's Hunter. I said, my name's Pat. I said, hello, Mr. Pat. How are you? And I said, fine. And I said, so you want to be a pilot? He says, I sure do. I mean, when I grow up, I said, how old are you, nine? I said, well, you got a couple of years, but let's go out and look at this airplane. So I took him outside, I put him in the left seat of the Comanche and told him about the yoke and the left and the right and the throttles and all that kind of stuff. And he was and he was asking some questions that no nine year old should know about about airplanes. And I said, wow, this kid's smart. And he was talking to me like he was about 15. So I have no doubt that Hunter will at some point be exploring Mars one day. Uh, but, you know, this is the, it, it's it's this. It's the same. I get goosebumps talking about it because it's exactly the same in the music industry as at least in in the in the area that I was in, where there that that camaraderie, that immediate connection uh, between musicians and immediate connection between aviation people, and and the, and they cross pollinate because it, it's just that's just the way we are. Yeah, I actually have a theory about it. Check me out on this and see if it holds any water for you. I think the reason, or at least part of the reason, that musicians and pilots tend to go back and forth so easily is there's a very rigid structure to both. You know, you've got to stay in key. You've got to be playing with the other people. You've got to, there, there is a structure. There's a rule book that you've got to follow, but no flight goes the way you think it's going to, and especially in pop, rock, jazz, blues, country, you're going to improvise. And... In, in that sense, I think they both have a lot of commonality because you have to learn that structure first. You know, whether you're taking music lessons yeah. or flight lessons, you learn the basics and let's adhere to this. What's the speed we want on final? What's the configuration? Where's the capo on this? What key yeah. are we? And we, we get all that together. After that, and we get comfortable, now we start to embellish. Do you, you think well, that makes sense at all? Yeah, and I'm going to tell you two stories. One, my daughter, when she was young, she decided that she wanted to play flute in the junior high school band. So we bought her a flute and and what and whatnot. Anyway, sometime that year during the school year, the Jethro Tull came to play in Houston. Ian Anderson, of course, the flute player, lead lead guy at, at Jethro Tull. The drummer of the band's an old friend of mine. So we were we were at the show and after afterwards we were back in the green room visiting and Ian was hanging around and and saw my daughter there and came up and struck up a conversation. I told him, hey, Ian, you know, my daughter is just learning how to play flute. And he said in his, you know, incomparable British accent, so do, do you know how to read music? And she said, well, yes, I do. And he says, that's too bad. Don't let it hurt your playing. And I, and I thought, that was really kind of that was really kind of cool, and I frankly I've forgotten what the second story was now. So. The first one was good enough to make up for it. Absolutely <laughs> lovely. By the way, one of the one of the uh, topics we had talked about discussing tonight included. 
while we finish up with the musician thing, let me throw up, go ahead and put in the comments. When do you suppose Rotax started as a company? Remember, Rotax is the 912. It's right. in the AirCam, it's in the Icon, it's in, it's become this really popular engine. When it's do you here. suppose that, that uh, company started? And for extra points, what did they make when they started out? Um, well, the musician thing, you know, you've got like the singer of Iron Maiden is a pilot and flies yeah. the tour airplane, yes. uh, which is a big Whopper 747 or something. Yeah. Um, Steve Morse, who was Steve with Morse, the, the, the Dixie pilot. Dregs, absolutely. There's all kinds of and it's, whether they're they're famous or they're just pikers like you and I. Yeah. It's really amazing how many musicians get it. And that's when I started flying. I was in a band professionally. Yeah. When I started flying, and it was just because I thought I could get out of New York City easier than car service, bus, train, whatever. And you can, but I didn't realize it would become a career. Yeah, yeah. Paul Lime, who is a, is a very, L-E-I-M, if you want to Google him. Paul is a, is a very well-known and highly respected national session player. Um, if, you, if you look at and listen to... Uh, oh, many, many, many of the hit records that were recorded in the, in the last uh, 20 years. You'll find Paul uh, on on the drum tracks. Uh, he, he usually is in the house band that plays in the um, those Nashville Christmas specials that, that they have every year. He's usually the drummer in the house band there. Um, and he's a pilot, too, has a couple of airplanes in the, on his trip um, uh, south of, around Murfreesboro, if I remember right. Uh, but a great pilot, great, great musician, too. But it's it's all that, uh, you know, that it's that right brain, left brain thing. I don't know that works somehow. I don't know. I don't I don't know how it works. <laughs> By the way, for those of you watching, put up in the comments. If you're an airplane owner, let us know what you own. And um, for those who are curious, yes, Pat has flown a Comanche. <laughs> it's not a joke, but. That's a standing, know. that's a running joke. <laughs> um. Rick Strelker says Bombardier snowmobiles. He's talking about Rotax. Is that what it started? Jo that is true. They used to make, bom well, maybe they still do make Bombardier snowmobiles. John Leon is closer, though, 100 years ago, a um, little more than 100 years ago. Rotax started in 1906 making bicycle axles. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. German company. And and that was what they were doing. By the way, when you watch those uh, World War II movies and they're going on the bombing mission to take out the ball bearing factories in Schweinfurt, that's who they were going after, Rotax. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's a fascinating engine, too. Um, it's, a, it's a liquid-cooled cylinder heads. Mm -hmm. um, you can use Evans waterless coolant. You can use uh, Prestone 50-50. I mean, you can use any of that kind of those kind of things. It'll run. Uh, it'll run uh, at the, uh, up to 15% ethanol. It prefers unleaded um, premium automobile gas, but it'll but it'll run. Um, uh, it'll run 100 low lead. You have to change your oil every really every 25 to 30 hours, as opposed to 50 ish, -ish uh, if you're running uh, 100 low lead on it. it. Has two carburetors. They're altitude compensating carburetors with bladders on them to help adjust the mixture. There's no mixture control in the cockpit. You turn the key to start it. You turn the key off to stop it. There's no mixture control. The car carburetors have to be balanced pneumatically and mechanically. Um, it's it's a it's a fascinating engine, and if you if you watch how they assemble those engines, um, they're 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 hand built, and mm -hmm. when they do the castings and whatnot, they they measure the pistons, they measure the cylinders, and all of that, and and they hand match the size of each piston to the size of each cylinder because you know there's a plus or minus tolerance on any kind of manufacturing operation. But they don't, they're not happy with the piston and the cylinder just being, well, it's within tolerance. They will actually go find a cylinder and a piston that are that are compatible with each other down to just microns. And it's one of the reasons that if you're burning oil in a Rotax engine, there's something wrong with that engine. Yeah, it is an amazing engine. I had them on my air cam. And, of course, one of the, one of the odd things is to check the oil level, you have to burp the engine. Yeah, you really want to learn to do that. You have to turn the propeller until right. you actually hear a gurgling sound, and now yeah. you can accurately check. But you never want to turn a Rotax prop backwards. No, that's a really bad thing, and you're going to end up with serious maintenance. Yeah, but, but you know that 
the the turbocharged the new the new excuse me the new fuel injected engines you don't have to burp those anymore oh really not the, well, not the fuel injectors on the air camp not the fastest airplane in the world but a twin engine and i'm kind of lazy so i would often dial back and i wasn't you know i'm, I'm flying around 3,500, 4,000 RPMs, because they're geared down, that's in your RPM. But I'd be burning five, five and a half gallons total, both sides. Yeah, yeah. That unleaded car gas. By yeah, the way, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of weird the first time you fi fire up a Rotax and you see you're climbing out at, what, 5,800 RPMs or something like that. And cruising at 5,200 RPMs, uh, when, when, we, when we ran them in my flight school, we usually taught at 48, 4,800 RPMs. It's, it, it, the engine's geared down 2.43 to 1 if it makes any difference. Yeah. Uh, so uh, well, <laughs> approximately. By the way, <laughs> Bill Graham flies an arrow, PA28R200. Yeah. Awesome for you, Bill. I was actually thinking about getting one of those when I found the 172, which Rich yeah. Dever has owned in 1966, Cessna 172 from 84 to present. That says something. If you've owned an airplane from 1984 till now, you're satisfied with that airplane. He's also had a couple of champs, which I can't blame you at all. Uh, Gary Risley's got a 78 Piper Lance Turbo T-Tail. Now, that's a cool machine. I like that a lot. John Leon is flying an RV-12IS. Yeah, uh, I've seen that airplane. That's a nice airplane. And oh, and Gary, Gary also boasts of a 12 string Alvarez, a Martin Grand Performance, and a six string Alvarez, and a, Gil, a, and a Gibson M111. So good, good uh, judgment there. You know, I've never flown an RV 12. They have a couple at AOPA, and I've been offered a flight, but you know, they, they just work us like dogs. And, and <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a terrible, terrible thing we have to do here. Uh, the workload is brutal. You don't even want to know. Let's not talk about it. I actually really would like to talk, fly RB12. I was just talking to um, Keith West, who you know, used to be with AOPA. He was just telling me what a remarkable airplane it is, and it's just a great trainer from what he says. Uses the Rotax 912, so it's, it's very inexpensive on operational costs. You're not using anywhere near the fuel. And, of course, if you can stick with the unleaded fuel, the oil changes, I, I think you can go up to 100 hours on an oil change if you stick with just unleaded fuel. Yeah, that's they, boy, but I believe you're yeah. allowed to. We went, we went, uh, we went 100 hours on, on between oil changes on our airplanes, but they were flying a lot and they didn't sit. Um, yeah, but uh, 50 is recommended, but you can certainly go up to 100. There's no problem whatsoever doing that. Um, just again, just, just watch the oil. Yeah, yeah, and Ed, and I'm assuming this is Q, and I, I apologize if I got that wrong. Ed. Ed's got the RV9A, which means it's tricycle gear. Instead of the RV9 would be a tail grinder. The 9 a is tricycle gear. What a screaming machine that is. I mean, mm -hmm. Ed, Ed, I'm curious, do you have constant speed prop on that or fixed pitch, and which engine did you choose? Because with the experimentals, You've got a lot of latitude on which engine and propeller combination you want to put in. What do you want in the panel? Experimentals are kind of fascinating, I think. I mean, yes, they are. I and no two are the same. No two are the same. Yeah, well, and you know, I found that when I had the air cam, you never find two air cams with the same panel. Yeah. Um, they all have different color schemes. They're, they're all laid out slightly different. And you'd think that such a basic airplane, they'd all pretty much fall in the line. Yeah, not at all. But have you ever owned an experimental pet? Um, no, I've I've not. I've done a fair amount of uh, flight training. Um, I've taken several people to instrument ratings in RV. I'm trying to remember which RV, maybe RV sixes. That's the side by side. Uh, they're all all of them have been tricycle gear. I don't remember which one. Uh, I've taken several people through instrument ratings and those things. And, 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 and in fact, I, I'll tell you, I was doing a flight review for a guy once. It's the first time I'd ever been in an RV. And, um, and we were doing a flight review that consisted of uh, a, 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 like an instrument proficiency check. So we were going to do some unusual attitudes. And, um, and so I figured, okay, so I, I will do some unusual attitudes. And I had never flown the RV before. So I grabbed the stick and I did something like that. We darn near ended up inverted. And I thought, wow, this is, this is a little bit extreme as far as the unusual attitude goes. And I learned very quickly that it's not a yank and bank airplane unless you intend to do airbags. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> By the way, Ed comes back and he says, his RV9A has an O3, uh, like Helm O320, so 160 horsepower, constant speed with dual Garmin touch screens, GTN 650, which we've used in the AOPA 152s. He's flown an IFR. And, of course, Ed used to have an air cam. I wonder if this is an opportunity to start a former air cam owner's support group, Ed. <laughs> you know, I, I loved having mine. It has some limitations. It doesn't actually fit my mission very well. But... In five years, it might fit my mission perfectly when I don't have any place to go. And I just want to be <laughs> The cool thing about the air cam, air cam and the tub path, they were the only airplanes I ever flew on a regular basis that you had to climb to pattern altitude at the end of the flight. <laughs> because yeah. you take off, you hit the four or 500 feet, and you're good. Let's go yeah. on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forget, forgetting, forgetting about all those cell phone towers that are flying <laughs> 500 feet now. Well, you know, the great thing in both the club and the air cam, you're going so slow. you got about 20 minutes before you get to that tower. <laughs> but, uh, well, hey, it's been a, a pretty darn good night, I think. I enjoyed doing this. Do you have any any topics that you really had a burning desire to get to? <laughs> there it goes back with the turducken. A, a turducken <laughs> is a turkey stuffed with a duck and a chicken. And I thought that was out there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quickly around the applause for Eric Webb, who is just the most amazing guy on the planet. He takes the challenge never, seriously, doesn't he? <laughs> never ask him how to build a nuclear device. That's not going to work out well for anything. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm going along with it. Eric Webb. And by the way, uh, if you been to Air Venture, if you've been to, uh, to Summit on any of the major events, Eric is usually there, so you can go see him. The key is, if you want to make good friends with Eric, bring him a pair of socks. I can't explain <laughs> it, but man loves socks. He just does. Hey, folks, thanks a lot. Pat, you, we've got a couple minutes here. Do you want to throw anything in, any, any kind of things you're doing coming up or things you're excited about or just a topic you'd like to talk about that refers to Texas? Oh gosh! Other than the fact that Texas is the greatest state in the union to to uh, to live and work, that's all I can tell you. And uh, it's uh, no, I, you know, something. We've got rusty pilots that are starting to uh, to kick off again live. I've got a couple of them coming up in in October, so thankfully we're starting to get a little bit back out there with the appropriate precautions, and and so that's good. So if anybody is interested in. Uh, Particular, these two in particular up in the Dallas area. So if you happen to be up there uh, in the uh, Midlothian, Texas, which is just south of uh, the DFW area uh, or, or over in McKinney uh, in October. Um, oh, and AOPA has got a fly in October. I think it's October the 1st. Uh, we're doing a uh, kind of a uh, mini fly in, in in Fort Worth. So if you do happen to be, you know, within reasonable flying distance of, of the west side of of uh, the Metroplex, stop into, um, it's going to be at Meacham Field. And I think it's October the 1st. You can find it on our website. So that would be fun. That might be commutable for me. I, I might have to come up hey, to that. Yeah, you've got a 172 now. Man, oh, man, you're breaking the speed of sound. I, and I like Texas. I, I mean, the barbecue is worth the trip. There's no doubt about the trip, absolutely. And you're right. I've got um, I've got some rusty pilots. We're starting to do them live again. I'm going to be going back up to Swanee County Airport in Live Oak, Florida, up in the Panhandle with Pine Forest and everything. And I, I do love it up there. I've done four of them up there as an annual event, and and I'm looking forward to going back. And then I'll be going down to Fort Myers for the Sundowners Flying Club, doing one there with them. Great flying club, well over a hundred members, just absolutely terrific folks so i'll i'll enjoy getting down there if you want to find out more about the fly-ins of course the um the, the community events thing that eric of course is putting up because he has a link for everything yeah. uh, if you want to find out answers to any questions that we didn't cover tonight or something that we didn't cover to your satisfaction Write to us at ambassadors at AOPA.org, and Pat will answer you right away. I, I will be napping because of my advanced age, but Pat will do it, no doubt. Let's gather back here again, shall we, on August 24th, which is once again a Tuesday night, 7 o'clock Eastern, 4 o'clock Pacific, the appropriate time zones in between. We'll come back here for episode 23 of Ask an Ambassador. I'll do my best to get Pat to come out of his shell and tell a story or two if I can. 
try and get Eric on the proper medication so he's not doing what he's been doing. Folks, thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. See you on the 24th. Good night. Bye.